Thanks so much, everyone. Uh, this is such a great crowd. Um, so uh, we're here to talk about in designing inclusive products. And as we get started, I'm going to tell you a little bit about who I am so you know who's going to be talking to you for the next you know, 40 minutes or so. So uh, I am a senior product manager at Google. I've been working there for about eight years. Um, before that, I got my computer science degree at Stanford. And while I've been at Google, uh, I have uh, worked on Google Search, Google Analytics, and I was also the first product manager on Project Fi, which is Google's wireless carrier service. For the last year, I've been working as the CEO of a team called Grasshopper. <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs> um, and we're working uh, within the Area 120 incubator at Google, working on an app uh, that is aiming to teach adults to learn to code. Um, in my spare time, I'm also uh, writing about topics um, around diversity and inclusion at fearofpoets.com and occasionally tweet at the Fear of Poets alias. So why am I here? Um, so as a uh, petite, mixed-race woman, uh, I am very well experienced with products that may not be made for me. That being said, I don't think that it's something that anyone is trying to do intentionally. They just maybe haven't really thought about what my use cases might be. So over the last several years, I've been trying to kind of get a bunch of different best practices to think about how could we make products that work for as many people as possible. And that's what I'm here to share with you today. So a couple of disclaimers uh, before we get started. Uh, first, this shit is really hard to talk about. So. My intention is not to offend anyone, but if I do, apologies in advance. Um, the second thing um, is that, uh, let's see, second thing is, oh gosh. Um, whew. All right. <laughs> um, one of the things that I wanted to say is that, um, ooh. all right, oh yes, um, is that uh, there is going to be some kind of, um, Topics in here that are kind of tough to talk about. So uh, if there are things that are, that are in here that are kind of offensive or whatever, it's, it's because they're there to show you what can happen when you don't build inclusive products. Um, it's there to, to build the story. Um, and the last thing is that nothing is going to uh, teach you how to build an inclusive product better than having a diverse and inclusive team. That being said, we could talk for hours about that, and that is not the purpose of today's talk. Uh, so just keeping that in mind, and if you want to talk about uh, diverse teams in the future, then um, let's chat. So getting into it, uh, why is building inclusive products a product manager's job, right? You could say, well, you know, it's the engineer's job, or it's the designers who should be making this all inclusive. Well, uh, as a product manager, you are the one who is regularly the uh, one who is deciding what the priorities are. You're the one who can sometimes say, hey, you know what, let's not move on to that next stage yet because we're not ready. So I really do think that it's, you know, there's all these different phases in the product uh, development life cycle, and we're going to talk about each one of them today. But you have the opportunity to make a difference at every stage and add um, a little inclusive touch to make your products more inclusive. So getting into it, let's talk about getting buy-in. So as a product manager, one of your jobs is to manage stakeholders. And those stakeholders may or may not uh, really be thinking about how important it is to be building inclusive products. So uh, ideally, your team just gets it. <laughs> you know, they're, they're super on board with inclusion. They're willing to take the time that it takes uh, to build inclusive products. But in case you aren't living in that perfect world, here are some talking points that you can use to talk about why inclusive products uh, really make a difference. So the first one are some stories. Um, in the 1970s, airbags were first invented. And unfortunately, the people who were in the room when airbags were created were basically average-sized men. This meant that when airbags hit the market, that uh, a lot of women and children actually died because the initial airbag design was not inclusive. Um, so Hopefully, the products you build will not be causing deaths, but <laughs> this is actually one of those scenarios that I think is hopefully in our, in our history um, and not in our future, but just kind of keep that in mind. Um, another case is the case of um, machine learning. Um, so uh, Google Photos, a couple of years ago, uh, launched a feature that auto-categorized um, a bunch of your different photos. And unfortunately, um, 
they uh, tagged two black people in a photo as gorillas. Um, this uh, was not the intention of the team that was doing this. Uh, um, that being said, um, it does expose that they may not have had as much user testing uh, as they might have uh, wished they had had. So there's cases in which um, having non-inclusive design can lead to unfortunate consequences like this. Um, one more thing. So I don't know if uh, y'all are familiar with uh, what Airbnb has been dealing with from a racial profiling perspective over the last year or so. But uh, there was cases where people would get denied their reservation because of the color of their skin. Um, and in Airbnb's case, I don't think that, again, that they were intentionally creating a platform that would encourage or reinforce racism. That being said, uh, the racism was already there um, in the population that it was serving. And what they have been trying to do over the last several years has been trying to change their platform to make decisions that helped counteract some of that bias. So at kind of each stage, whether it's you know, intentional neglect or intentional or there's neglect, there's cases where the machine learning just isn't working that well, or you're creating a platform that many people use, there's places where non-inclusive design can have really sad unintended consequences. That being said, if uh, the stakeholders don't quite like the stories, but they like numbers, let's talk through some numbers. So uh, as far as the racial population of the United States, um, here's a recent uh, analysis by Pew Research about the uh, distribution of race in the United States. As you can see, it's actually, in the, and this is a, also a projection. So you can see that the US is getting more diverse. So maybe you can tell your stakeholders that uh, this is planning for the future <laughs> if, uh, if they're uh, trying to uh, plan for racial uh, equity. Um, another th way to think about it is the uh, spectrum of which people can actually use, physically use the products that are being developed. So in 2003, Microsoft commissioned a, a research study that said, well, what is the spectrum of uh, physical capabilities within our population? I think many times people think of products as, hey, there's a bunch of people over here that use products like everyone else. And then there's this small portion off to the side that we have to do special things for. And I think what I want you to take away from this particular analysis was that there's actually a huge spectrum that the majority of people actually have with regards to their ability to interact with the pieces of uh, software or hardware that we create as product managers. So this could be th differences in physical mobility, it could be differences in uh, the way that people see, but it is a spectrum and not necessarily a here is everyone and a small margin that needs special um, assistance. Age is also another area that we can be thinking about or should be thinking more about when it comes to building inclusive products. So Pew also did a research where uh, they are projecting out that the overall world population is aging. Or you could look at it a different way, which is that uh, as product managers, a lot of us think about, uh, you know, millennials are really cool to talk about or Gen Z. Um, they're getting a lot of conversation. But if you look at half of the adult population is over the age of 45. And so if you're not building products for the people on that other side of that um, graph, then you're cutting out your half of your potential user population. So these are some numbers to maybe think about uh, with your stakeholders. And then if the numbers don't get to them, maybe costs <laughs> will uh, you know, appeal to the bottom line. So when you don't build inclusive products, there's also uh, the cost or, of damage to the, the brand or business due to bad PR, like some of the things I was just showing around Google Photos or Airbnb. Um, there's also excessive support costs. So I used to run uh, support for Project Fi from a product perspective, and I can tell you, you don't really want people calling in because it's really expensive. And if you build a product where people are calling in all the time because their product doesn't work for, for them, that's going to be a lot of money. So if you build more inclusive products up front, you're actually spending less to support your larger population. There's also lawsuits. I can't really predict what these things might be, but they're expensive. <laughs> <laughs> um, product returns also very similarly to, to excessive support costs. If someone buys your product and it doesn't work for them, they're going to return it, and that's going to be really expensive. Um, and there, lastly, is this post-launch reworking of the product. So say you've been working for the last several months or the past couple of years on the perfect product, 
uh, and you launch it and it turns out it wasn't very inclusive and so a lot of the people that you really wanted to use your product didn't actually end up using it. So now you have your active user population that you have to be actively supporting and also doing a bunch of new stage stuff to work out why the people that you were hoping to use your product aren't using it, that's really expensive. So hopefully between the stories, the numbers, and the costs, you can convince your stakeholders that building inclusive products from the very beginning is worth it. Next, on to identifying your users and their needs. So ideally in the kind of product design process, you start with your users, figure out what their needs are, then you build your product. So that's where we're starting here. And the first part is uh, trying to interview a bunch of potential users and then develop personas. So invest at the very beginning on having a diverse set of people that you're interviewing for your personas. Some of the things you can do here, uh, kind of glibly, uh, think of who your users might be and find them. <laughs> However, uh, a more useful tactic is Craigslist. So I use Craigslist a lot. Um, it's remarkable how, how many different types of people use Craigslist. And if you put out a link that just says, hey, do you want to do a user study for you know, you know, 25 bucks for 30 minutes or something like that, you get a lot of people from very different backgrounds. <laughs> um, also think through partnerships. So if your product is partnering with anyone else, they might have an existing user base that matches what you want your user base to be, because they're, they're your partner. And then you can ask them for a diverse set of people from their existing user base that you might be able to interview. Um, and lastly, friends of friends or teammates. You know, if you're looking for a certain t demographic that you want to be infusing into your persona pool, then you know, use a network effect. Um, and it's actually a surprise. It's, it's been really helpful for me um, in, in my own work. Um, and then if you have an existing product, two tips. Uh, one is uh, if you have an existing product and you want to interview your existing user set, make sure that, that you try to find as many diverse people in that user set as possible. Um, sometimes it's really easy to say, hey, they're our user, let's just talk to them. But really try to find um, a, a bunch of different people. It'll make your, um, your interviews a lot richer. And the second piece around having an existing product is that find people who aren't using your product and ask them why. So it might turn out that your product as it currently is is excluding a certain subpopulation. Um, go and find that group and talk to them and maybe figure out why they aren't using it and that can be really informative to your next stage of product development. So then once you've done hopefully a large set of interviews, now it's time to distill the, that research down into personas that will then inform your product design. So uh, there's a researcher named Indy Young, um, and just so you know, I have these links in my talk. Um, they're at the bottom. I have on the Fear of Poets um, site that I have, I've uploaded my site, uh, this deck there, so you can like click on these things later. There's some really great um, uh, research and very long form stuff here that I've tried to distill down. So for Indy Young, she posted this particular tweet um, a while back that uh, was kind of controversial was, please remove age, gender, ethnicity, location from your personas. None of these things cause behavior slash thinking, but they can cause a lot of assumptions. And so what she means by that is like, as soon as you start to you know, add things like age, gender, ethnicity, it starts coming loaded with a bunch of different stereotypes. And is that actually the thing that is going to help drive forward your, your uh, product design? Well, her point is, focus on motivations. Like that is so much richer than what someone's age is. You want to know why they want to do something. Um, so her, she, she encourages focus on motivations in your personas. Leave kind of everything else out if you can. Um, another tip is if you do have uh, names, pick gender neutral names. So a name like Pat could be Patrick or Patricia. Um, these types of things can then make people a little more um, less reliant on the stereotypes that might inform their thinking. And then lastly, um, if you do just, you can uh, add demographics if people are um, not really empathizing with the persona, but if you have the opportunity, add counterintuitive uh, uh, characteristics or demographics to the persona. So for instance, uh, she gives the example of um, the, a, a user who is kind of a technophobe, who has, uh, is uncomfortable with technology and is worried about data privacy security stuff. And sometimes that can be a persona of someone who's kind of on, on the older side. Um, but it could also be a 35-year-old mother of two. 
Um, and so kind of adding these counterintuitive demographics can cause people to think more about the motivations than, say, leaning into those stereotypes and being like, oh, well, everyone in that category thinks that, and that's not something that we really need to deal with. <laughs> so to give an example, I'm not going to read all this, but this is just kind of an example of uh, some persona's work that she did as a, uh, for people who uh, were checking or not checking <laughs> their luggage. And so this protect stuff persona is a person who is worried about their stuff getting battered uh, when it's checked, and so they want to keep it with them. It's because they have things like their guitar, and it has sentimental value. So th they're going to always uh, bring things on uh, the plane with them. That's their motivation. Um, as opposed to this won't go aboard persona, which is they always have something. They, you know, beer from their uh, trip to Belgium or uh, their scuba gear. So they're always going to be checking their luggage because they can't otherwise bring the stuff that they want. So as you can see here, no names, no ages, no demographics, but strictly motivations. And this can be a really solid foundation for doing uh, product design work. All right, now matching your business to your users. So we spend a lot of time talking about, like, um, or at least when I have talked uh, with other people about building inclusive products, we spend a lot of time about you know, how are we building it. But I think there's a stage before that, which is when you're you know, pitching your business. Um, what are some of the things that before you even start building, you start deciding as a product manager that actually will impact the inclusiveness of your product? So the first thing is platform. So I'm going to talk about mobile versus desktop. So it turns out there's more people who have mobile phones than desktop computers. Um, I think we are moving more and more to a mobile first world, but it's worth looking at the numbers. More Americans own a smartphone than a desktop. And then if you look at something like the Indian market, then you start saying that 34% you know, of Indians own a, a smartphone, whereas only 10% own a desktop. There's also an increasing trend of people who are mobile dependent. These are people who can only access the internet through their mobile device. This population in the United States tends to skew towards the young, uh, underrepresented minorities, and lower income. And so if you want to kind of be a more equitable uh, uh, product, Try thinking about going mobile, at, uh, making your mobile experience as strong as possible because these are people who might not otherwise be able to access your product. Which also brings me to iPhone versus Android, right? I've often heard that iPhone, you know, you develop for iPhone first because that's where the money is, they're all really rich. Um, but if you cut out the Android population, you're actually being exclusive. So if you have the opportunity to make your product for both iPhone and Android, why not? That's going to be more users. It's going to be more inclusive. And when there's tools like, say, React Native, or even better, maybe a, a progressive mobile web app, um, you can actually build these products to work on both platforms and make it available to everyone. I also want to talk about things like pricing. So um, here right, is a graph of the amount of disposable income Americans have in a given year. 70% of the United States has less than $2,000 in disposable income each month. So if you think about that, if you're building a product that's you know, the same amount as, say, Spotify, right? It's like eight, nine, or eight bucks, 10 bucks. Um, that is what, you know, uh, one, one twentieth of a person's disposable income of, you know, 70% or do they even have that money, right? And so if you start thinking about pricing, it's not just about like, oh, I think I could get this much money, start thinking about who your users actually are and do they have the disposable income to actually be able to afford your product. And then even beyond the United States, start looking at, um, oops, there we go, the rest of the world. So that was a graph for the United States. We're looking pretty good with regards to the rest of the, United, or the, rest of the world with regards to disposable income, right? So um, one thing to keep in mind when you think about pricing is that free is the most inclusive price. So not everyone can make products that are free, but if you have the opportunity, that is going to make it accessible to more people. Another thing to keep in mind for pricing is uh, the ability to budget is important. Um, I'm saying this explicitly because of we're in Silicon Valley. Not everyone thinks that budgeting is as important as it actually is, but the majority of the world budgets, and the majority of the world budgets really well. So when I was on Project Phi, we had this uh, pricing model, which is pay for a certain amount, and then we'll credit you back, or pay, you pay over. Um, and a lot of people were asking, 
why are you doing that? Why don't you just pay for what you use? That just makes sense mathematically. But the reason why we went that way and the reason why it tested so much better with real customers was because people wanted the ability to budget. And so as you think about pricing, do you think about the importance of budget and where pe that your, your product will fit in a user's budget? And the last thing is also think about the price based on the value to the customer, not based off of cost. So there's a lot of research around pricing best practices, um, why you should not do cost-based pricing. However, um, there's a lot of really good reasons why you should price based on value to the customer. Because cost is a function of how many people are using your product. And so if you can develop a product and then find its value for a larger number of people, you will actually reduce your costs. So um, just some tips to keep in mind as you're developing your, your business story around the product before you get into actually building it. But now, on to building it, because it's the really fun part. So um, this is where I think you, know, you start getting involved much more with the engineers and the designers to build and, and bring your product to life. So a couple of things, there's, there's a lot of different vectors upon which you can start thinking about inclusion and design when it comes to the building piece. The first one I want to touch on is designing for privacy and user safety. <laughs> so um, I, I recognize there's laughter in the room, uh, but uh, this is actually a really sad story. <laughs> um, so there is a class of people uh, where uh, I feel like they don't get talked often enough about when it comes to product design. Uh, these are people who might be victims of abuse, uh, the LGBTQ community, um, people, kids who are subject to bullying. And for these users, privacy and security are actually incredibly important and can often be the difference of you know, physical safety or life and death. So um, a couple of stories. Um, this particular article was written um, at the um, launch of the Google Buzz uh, thing. This was 2010, so it's a long time ago, and we've learned a lot since then. But what happened is that we created a social product that auto-created connections between people or made them think that those were the, those connections based off of their most frequent contacts. This person's most frequent contacts were her boyfriend, her mother, and her abusive ex-husband. And that is something where uh, we violated that person's trust and safety um, at that point in time. There's another uh, link here, too, about um, how Google outed someone, um, where there was an auto lookup feature where someone was presenting their old and authentic gender at their place of business. And then uh, through an auto lookup feature, their employer ended up finding out um, their new authentic gender. And that was uh, a thing that was not desirable, as you can imagine, um, from the person um, who had been going through this transition. Um, so another thing to think about with regards to privacy and safety, this is an example of really great local um, safety features design. This is a screenshot from a product called uh, Recovery Record. Um, it is an app for people with eating disorders. So uh, when we think about phones, we often think of them as being ours. Uh, they are things that are private. They are things that if someone was to take them, that maybe they might find things that uh, they you know, might, that might be compromising. So people don't, you don't give your phone out. But not a lot of people, or there's, sorry, there are some people who don't have that choice. There's, for instance, LGBTQ youth or uh, people uh, who have eating disorders where their, their family will take their phone from them um, and try to figure out what's going on. So in this particular case, a recovery record, uh, they have this uh, feature called discrete reminders. So these are reminders to eat. Uh, however, if someone was to take this person's phone and see a notification like, buy a gift for Cindy at lunch, they wouldn't actually think this person has an eating disorder. They think they have to you know, buy a gift for a friend. So um, these are kind of things that you can think about for uh, people who need a little more privacy and safety um, and what they can do if, if the uh, privacy of their phone is, uh, is compromised. Uh, another thing to think about is also location sharing. So for the majority of the world, location sharing is kind of fun. You can see where people are. But again, uh, it only is as fun as uh, transparency is actually there. So as you're building uh, safety fe or sorry, location sharing features, think about who can actually see the user's location. Is it friends? Is it people that you have opted to share with? Or is it public and anyone could look at it? Um, or maybe think about what actions trigger the location sharing 
Or does the user know when their location is being shared? It could turn out that that person is at a location that might reveal something about them that maybe they don't want to be shared. Or it could also be the case that someone is getting bullied and now their location is being shared with the people who are bullying them. So these are things to just kind of think about as you're building in location sharing features. There's also engineering for accessibility. So for people who can't necessarily see the user interface, uh, like um, you know, in, the, in all the vivid colors that your um, UX designers have, have uh, carefully designed, uh, there are features to help those people uh, use your technology. So these are things like screen readers uh, for web, and then also talkback and voiceover for Android and iOS, respectively. Um, these are things that uh, <laughs> allow a user to kind of tab through your user interface and read out what is in your user interface. Um, however, these things only work as well as your ability to engineer them. So if you have a, um, so for instance, the screen readers will uh, follow a certain tab order. And some of the engineering teams that I've worked with when they first built uh, a version of a user interface, the tabbing was going like all over the place. And it was very incoherent as to what was actually going on. So you can work with your engineering team to actually create a coherent story as the, uh, uh, the screen reader or talkback is, is going through the user interface so that people who have um, sight impairment can actually use your product. There's also designing for colorblindness. So uh, for most of the world, the rainbow looks like this. Uh, but one in 12 men and one in 200 women start to see the, this rainbow like this. Maybe there's some in the room. <laughs> um, and uh, it's really important to kind of keep these things in mind as you're designing a color palette um, for a particular, um, or for designing a color palette for your product. Um, there's some really great tips in this particular blog um, about how to design for color blindness. Um, but one of the things that I thought I would pull out is uh, so Facebook. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg is, is uh, colorblind, um, and so he designed Facebook in blue because he can see that one the best. Um, and you can see here that there are some errors, right? And they're in red. Um, and that is a color that is sometimes hard for people to see. So you don't want to have your user interface only show errors in colors. Also include iconography. So if a person can't see that color contrast, there's other indicators that maybe they need to be fixing something. Um, all right, on to speed. Uh, so this is a world map of how fast the internet is for most people. Um, us in America, we're not as good as Australia, uh, but uh, we do have some pretty good internet. And uh, you should be thinking about what is the experience like for people who have uh, slower connections in order to reach more people. So uh, I've actually heard that Facebook, they have a network uh, on 2G to force the people in the, the Facebook Plex to make sure that their products work well on 2G. Um, there's also, I think, some features in Chrome that allow you to slow down your connection speed to see what your website would look like and load at different connection speeds. All right, some other things to think about. So forms. Forms can be inclusive. They can also be exclusive. Uh, I remember uh, as a 10-year-old trying to fill out some standardized tests, that I had to pick one race, and it was very confusing for me. Um, I was like, which one do I choose? Um, but uh, I think that race forms uh, have uh, gotten a little more inclusive. It's much more of a check all that apply or fill things in. Um, but when it comes to gender, uh, it can sometimes still be a little um, uh, narrower than it, sh it should be. And so there's um, a great resource here about all the different things that you can do to make uh, your kind of gender form more inclusive. Um, one of the things that it, it says is, do you need to be asking for gender in the first place? What, what value do you have from that? But then also think about the use case that you have uh, for that particular uh, uh, data. So this one, it's asking for gender because it wants to be able to have a user interface that addresses their user with the correct pronoun. So it's really tailored to that use case and also has this really nice field that says custom pronouns. One more thing is uh, around screen size. So I have tiny hands. I have uh, sometimes almost sprained my wrists uh, using some of the very large phones that are uh, in vogue right now. Um, but it's in both the small and large case, it's really something to think about. So uh, I heard the story of a person who was working on an app for crane inspectors. And no one was using their crane inspector app. 
and they sent someone out to the field and said, hey, you know, why aren't you using our app? And the, apparently a lot of crane ins inspectors have large hands, and they made all the buttons very small. <laughs> and so one way around that was uh, they gotten a stylus so that the, they could you know, use the stylus to navigate the UI, but they didn't want to take a stylus with them up on the crane. So as a result, uh, they just weren't using the app. So if, if testing out your app with a, major, with a large variety of people with different hand sizes can actually be really helpful. All right, the last piece of build it is user test the shit out of everything. <laughs> You're only going to have an inclusive product if you have as many people using it as possible. Um, again, here, Craigslist can be your friend. Uh, just ask a bunch of people to come in, use your product. Um, it's, it's a good, fast, cheap way um, to get a bunch of different uh, types of people using your product. Um, maybe even better than this, though, because Craigslist is pretty local. You know, we're in the Silicon Valley bubble. Uh, maybe think about going for a roadshow. So maybe take your product uh, to the East Coast, to Middle America, to someplace rural. Um, if you're trying to get international users, maybe even go to those places and you know, have some, some great food while you're there. <laughs> um, but that can also be pretty expensive. Um, so a kind of cheap tool that I would recommend is usertesting.com. This is a product that allows you to uh, either give your app or your website to a, a panel of people. These people can be from um, a broad range of <coughs> socioeconomic groups and also different levels of uh, technical facility. And uh, they will screen record uh, people as they do the different tasks that you ask them. Um, and it's pretty cost effective. So if you can't afford a roadshow, uh, this is a pretty good way to get a broad set of users using your product. Uh, and lastly, uh, create a network at your company. So if you happen to be at a larger company, you can actually recruit a set of people from diverse backgrounds and say, hey, before this goes out, can you just kind of give it a, a run through? Um, and that might be a good way to bootstrap um, inclusive user testing. All right, now on to go to market. So you've built this amazing product. Now you want people to start using it. So before we go any further, I'm going to say, warning, proceed with caution. <laughs> there are two things here. One, uh, if you are building a product and it's not inclusive, but you decide to do inclusive product marketing, people will call you out on that. <laughs> it is not a way to put lipstick on a pig. Um, the second thing to note here is proceeding with caution is even if your goal is inclusion, if you don't have a diverse set of people vetting your marketing campaign, it can really backfire. And as an example, Dove uh, did this a couple weeks ago, where they had this awful commercial where they had a black woman turning into a white woman. Um, really insensitive, very much reflects the fact that there was not a black person in the room when they were pitching this, completing it. Um, and uh, when they talked to Dove, Dove was like, well, we were trying to be inclusive. I was like, well, you were, but it did not hit the mark. Um, so as you're thinking about inclusive go-to-market strategy, do keep some of these things in mind. So you don't need to hit you know, diversity right in the head. What you can do is something a little more like what Apple did with their iPod uh, uh, advertisements. So this is kind of old, but it's so good and it's so iconic. And the reason for this is because they have these profiles. It's not, you're not looking at a specific person, but you can almost like imagine yourself as one of these silhouettes. And that's, I think, a, think a really cool thing about marketing, is that the best marketing is an invitation to the people that you want to be using your product. And so what iPod did, Apple did here, is that they tried to um, have people imagine themselves as an iPod user. And I think there's a lot of different ways that you can start to do that and work that into your go-to-market strategy. So for instance, uh, Facebook has this inclusive hands resource. So they've done this thing where they have all of these um, uh, photos of people using phones. And if you want to have a screenshot of your app, you can have a bunch of different types of hands using it. And that's really cool. And people can see themselves maybe using that a little bit more than, say, you know, the standard you know, white male hand. Um, Slack also did this really cool thing where when they introduced the Add to Slack button, they had a brown hand. Um, and it was a small thing, but it's actually really big for a lot of people. And so these are the types of things that you can start to do for your go-to-market that invites other people from diverse backgrounds and see themselves as one of your uh, customers. 
Um, I'll end with some work here uh, that's done by Alice Lee. Um, Alice Lee um, redid um, the WordPress site to have these really cute illustrations. But what she did as part of, as part of her process is she created people with um, different body shapes, um, a color palette uh, with different skin tones, and also included people in different scenarios. So, you know, this person's in a workshop, uh, this woman is wearing a hijab. Um, and what this does, again, is it, they're, they're lower fidelity, so they're not like images of people. But because they're diverse, uh, they really allow people uh, from a broad set of backgrounds to imagine themselves as invited to be using this product. Um, and she ha has a really good analysis of uh, her work there. All right, so you've launched your product. One last quick thing about the numbers. So now you've launched, you're getting all this really, really great data. Just be cautious of how you interpret that data. You could say like, everyone loves our product, like you know, our CSAT scores are out, you know, out, out, out the door or out the roof or whatever. Um, but that may not only be a, a subset of people. You know, it, it may turn out that your product is actually excluding a subgroup of people and they're not gonna use your product. You're not even hearing from them. And so as you look at your data that's coming in, uh, try to look at um, different subsets of people um, and see if you can try to find insights and also figure out who isn't your, using your product because uh, they're not gonna be part of your numbers. So with that, I'll just kind of remind you all that at every single stage, of the product development process, you can make a difference and add inclusion. And with that, I'll open it up for Q&A. Uh, question in the back. Hey, thanks for that great talk. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, I'm supposed to be repeating the questions. So uh, the question is, um, how do you strike the balance between inclusion uh, as well as perfection in some sense? Um, and then, especially, uh, you're saying CoverGirl. Uh, tr I, I'm actually less familiar with what CoverGirl's been doing, but they... Like, like for example, let's say you look at a two-page commercial. Yeah. And you know, everyone is pushing that, like, pearly white, beautiful people. Ah, yeah. And you look around the room, probably people who don't look that way. Yeah, yeah. So imagine a campaign with just people's smiles weren't perfectly pearly. Right, right. Uh, so, yeah, so uh, the, the example being given is uh, on a toothpaste commercial, they're showing, you know, pearly white teeth because that's the, the, the goal. Um, but uh, in reality, that's not really uh, what most people's teeth look like. Um, and uh, how, how do you um, kind of counterbalance those two things? Um, and so I'm a little biased here. Like, I really love the fact that people are starting to do advertising campaigns that are um, no Photoshop. So there's a couple of uh, fashion companies like ModCloth, I think, led the charge, uh, where they're saying, we don't do Photoshop. Everyone is super real. Um, I think also uh, Victoria's Secret had a really interesting, I think it was this summer or this spring, where one of their uh, lingerie models, they put, put a post on Instagram, and either it was a mistake or not, but uh, the model had stretch marks, and everyone was like, holy shit, Victoria's Secret models have stretch marks. Yeah, that's <laughs> truth. Um, and I think that, uh, I think people do really want or crave almost that more authentic stuff, but I don't know if it sells. <laughs> Um, I think that's, that's really the crux of it. Um, and I honestly don't know, but I think that if we kind of move more of what we're looking for and, and reinforce those messages of authenticity, I think we're going to see more of it in our advertising. Um, at least that's my hope. Yeah. Yeah. So you mentioned making arguments to stakeholders for yeah. inclusiveness. Yeah. Uh, what if the data were to overwhelmingly show that a certain factor just isn't worth being inclusive about? So for example, you want to make your product inclusive to autistic users, uh -huh. and you know there might be some moral onus to make it inclusive, mm -hmm. but the data just overwhelmingly doesn't financially support it. Would you still push for that generally, or not really? Yeah. So I think the question is, um, so if it turns out that the data uh, counteracts the 
uh, investment in inclusion. So maybe it costs too much to, to be inclusive to that particular subgroup. What do you do? <laughs> um, and uh, first off, uh, I would kind of almost applaud the team for at least having the, the discussion, right. the trade-off, and like looking really, really deep. Um, if it gets to that point, uh, it's really hard because at the end of the day, many of us are, are building businesses. Um, I think the hope would be that you can try to make tweaks around the fringes maybe uh, that will make it more inclusive uh, around the, like, or, or maybe the things that are needed to support that group are also needed by other groups. Um, I think that actually tends to be more often the case than not, is that uh, if you look at any particular subgroup, there's going to be a portion, uh, or sorry, there's going to be another subgroup that needs something similar. So maybe you can tie it uh, to other, or you can tie the features needed for, say, an autistic user to the needs of other users um, and see if you can justify it that way. Um, I'm going to, I forget who did first, but. Okay. Yeah. So my comment is Huang, and my question is like for a big website like Google and or Facebook, sometimes it create a filter like a bubble, like mm. people just say what they want to see, and sometimes like people that they cannot reach the information that they maybe they don't know that yet they want to see or they need to see something. Yeah. So how is it like inclusive or exclusive? <coughs> All right, that's a tough question. It's basically, uh, so people who are using Facebook or Google, um, we have a lot of personalization features in each one of those, and it can create a bubble uh, around what types of information that person can see and whether or not that's inclusive or, or not. Um, and uh, in, in some ways, it's like the personalization features are incredibly inclusive, let's say, because it's exactly what the person wants to see. Um, but I think that uh, the recent political dialogue that we've been seeing or the, the um, notes about fake news, um, I think that is causing a lot of these platforms to rethink some of uh, these policies. Um, I don't know if uh, I would necessarily categorize that as inclusive or exclusive, but more of a, a larger political uh, and, and product discussion around how do we uh, decide what people see and don't see. Um, based off of their choice. So, yeah. um, I'll do you and then, then you. Yeah, so cool. I'm trying to see how uh, you can make this pragmatic, what you're talking about. So, mm. let's say I'm a product manager yeah. and I want this message of inclusion to really go down the line all the way design, engineering, everybody else, right? Mm -hmm. So, if, it, if I don't put it in the persona, mm -hmm. what's the vehicle to really move it, propagate it, enforce it? Yeah, so how do you kind of apply many of the things I talked about and put them into practice um, kind of at every stage or maybe only at one of the stages if that's all that you can really uh, so I'm access? About the baby example, right? So mm -hmm. the baby had the wheel. Like if yeah. there's no persona for the baby, yeah. you know, how, how does that get? Yeah. Um, so I think uh, one of the things that's probably the, the biggest lever you can pull here is the user test everything. So, um, and that's just like a, um, it's a standard process in the product development cycle, and then you can just make sure that a lot of people are being brought in. Um, so if, if you know, you've kind of skipped the persona stage or in the engineering phase, you can actually kind of circumvent it by uh, planting certain people. It, uh, like, oh, we haven't had this type of user yet use our product. Let's see how it is. And then to have the user researchers be like, oh, God, that was awful. <laughs> um, so th and that can cause um, some, some repercussions to go kind of back to the drawing board. Um, I think that uh, all of these tips here, um, it's going to be kind of soul crushing probably to do all of them at once. But what I'm trying to do is give you a bunch of toolkits to think about at every stage. And you can probably start kind of chipping away um, to make things more inclusive. But I think the user testing is going to be the place to really put the lever on. Uh, if you had to pick some place to move, to really have people feel the pain of a product being not inclusive. That just seems a little counterintuitive to mm. leave it to the testing phase too. Oh yeah, no, it's, it's definitely uh, not the right order of things. Um, if that's, uh, but it is the type of thing that if that is the only lever you have, that's probably going to be the most impactful one. If you do have the opportunity though to start earlier up in the funnel, like do it. <laughs> Back there? Um, how do you think about competition when you do 
Mm -hmm. uh, for the users. Mm -hmm. One example I think of is like maybe uh, Java is a app that's yeah. used for those uh, hikers mm -hmm. and then runners. And then if you want to be more exclusive, then you have to include uh, people that are not, not that professional in the sport. Mm -hmm. and then there will be more and more substitutes in the market that you can do. And so mm -hmm. Gotcha. So uh, the question is kind of how do you think about competition with products as uh, you might have to uh, expand the overall set of use cases that you need to support in order to be more competitive in the market? Um, so I think, um, so there, there's kind of like two phases here that I didn't really quite talk about. Um, there's the, um, the startup phase and then there's the big company phase. And when you're doing a startup, um, you almost kind of uh, want to figure out who your very narrow target audience is and try to build a perfect product for them and then like move further out. And then these are the tips that you, and tricks that you can use to like broaden your scope. Um, with a large company like Google where I've been at, it's like you should be thinking about this stuff all from the beginning because on day one that you launch, it's going to be millions of people who include lots of the people um, impacted here. So um, as far as like the case of say Strava, um, they're in that kind of startup phase where they're uh, finding a target audience, being really successful in them, and then starting to like, move into more markets. Um, I think that uh, as, as you're scaling, you, and as a startup in general, you just have to be very conscious of who, who you're targeting uh, and not to go too far too soon. But if you do have, say, like, all right, now I'm going to target. So I have the pro runners, and now I have the amateur runners. Um, can I get some of those amateur runners? Uh, can I get a diverse set of people in that space? So you don't want to go like, all right, in order for us to be inclusive, now we're doing uh, swimmers and uh, bikers and uh, people who are doing <coughs> synchronized swimming. Like it's going to be probably a little too much to, to do, but it, within each target set that you have, if you have a business case for it, try to make that user base as inclusive or diverse as possible so you can make your, your product inclusive within that space. That was a really good talk. Um, Thanks. How would you approach B2B product management when you're trying to build inclusive products? Okay. So how would I approach B2B product management with regards to inclusion? Right. Um, so I worked on Google Analytics uh, for a number of years. Um, and it was uh, kind of remarkable how uh, B2B versus consumer product development is incredibly different. The way I like to characterize it is that B2B, uh, people just really want to tell you what they want. <laughs> Whereas consumers are like, I don't know what I want. Everything's great. <laughs> and then you have to kind of like narrow in to figure out uh, what, what it is that they actually need. Um, for B2B, I think, again, kind of going back to the question of, you know, who's your target audience? Um, and then trying to figure out, uh, like, are there different flavors uh, that you want within that target audience? So um, if you were to go after... Um, Gosh, OK, I'm trying, like, lots of different thoughts. So one is just like making sure that the businesses that you're, use, that you're servicing have um, a lot of different characteristics. So you might find, say, um, I'm, I'm thinking in my mind uh, that uh, there was one particular company uh, that worked with us all the time on Google Analytics. And they ran a uh, was it small like home rental in North Carolina. And they were fantastic. They were always helping us uh, with, with everything. But they were this, um, this, this small company that really loved to use Google Analytics. But we needed to find other people in that kind of portfolio of like roughly the same number of users, same amount of needs, same amount of you know, um, spend that was happening. So you want to try to find other use cases or other companies that kind of fit the same profile to create a persona. Um, so that's kind of like in the business case. Um, but then also to kind of come back to some of these things. So like um, you're still going to run into things like um, uh, the accessibility engineering, the colorblindness stuff. Um, I think there's things that span both consumer and B2B when it comes to the actual experience of using the product as far as the usability that you can also kind of suss out with user testing. Or 
So it's uh, based off of user testing. If a bunch of people give you the same feedback or different feedback, oh, totally, feedback. totally different feedback. Yeah. Um, so if you have, uh, so, so just my rule of thumb with user testing in general is that uh, you try to, uh, like, you, you want to have a certain n of, of people, and beyond a certain n, it ends up being um, a little bit uh, repetitive. Um, and so if it turns out that everyone is giving you very, very different feedback, uh, then there might be something actually more wrong at the core. Um, than uh, it being that there's a bunch of different user, uh, user issues. So you'll find that if you have a diverse set of users, uh, they'll still find the same usability issues. You know, if you do like eight interviews, probably like five of them will find the same thing if it's like really a, a usability issue. Um, so I think what I would kind of do there is like if, if everyone is giving you feedback and they're struggling, there might be something a little bit more core uh, happening at, at, the, at the base uh, than it being a particular usability issue. So, uh, yeah. so thanks for this. It's a really meaningful discussion. Oh, um, I'm wondering about um, in terms of like how would you best like measure the ROI for more inclusive products, right? Like yeah. what are the important Oof. metrics yeah. to communicate to your stakeholders? Yeah, um, so w how do you measure the ROI of inclusiveness and report back to stakeholders? Yeah. Um, that one's really hard, and I think the part of the reason why building for inclusiveness is really hard is because sometimes it, it's this kind of fuzzy thing that you can't put a number to, whereas like if you put a you know, number to dollars, that speaks really, really well. Um, I think that uh, stories of inclusion, so a lot of the, the brand stuff or the qualitative stuff ends up um, being slightly more impactful here. Um, but you can also, um, if you have the opportunity to get data, if you have a lot of data, and you can actually ask people maybe for the demographics in a user study or an opt-in or something, you don't want to, as I was saying earlier, you don't necessarily want to have to force people to ask questions. But you can mine around that data and say, like, well, this particular user base with these demographics is not spending as much money as this other one. So there's a problem here, like, let's fix it. Uh, because they could be spending as much as this. Um, you can kind of, if you have access to that data, um, it can be hard to do at scale. Um, so I do find that the inclusive stuff is a little bit easier to sell as stories. Yeah. Uh -huh. And I'll get you in the back in just a sec. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, cool. Um, so thanks for coming, Laura. Um, yeah. So with all these factors you have to consider for building inclusion products, do you ever find yourself having to prioritize which factors you want to address um, first? Oh, yeah. And if so, like, how do you determine like, the, the top priority? Yeah, so I think, uh, so the question is, how do you prioritize across all these different things? And I'm, I'm like smiling at my team back there because, you know, we're, we're working on some of these things, but it's, it's hard to tackle all of them. Um, and I think part of it is uh, figuring out, like, what, what's a quick win? You know, if you can have the opportunity to do a quick win. So we had a, a progress bar in our app. And we actually have someone on our team who's colorblind. He's like, I can't tell the difference here. <laughs> and you're like, okay, let's just fix that. But it's just, you know, it's a hex value. It's it's super easy. So let's let's do the quick wins. Um, I also think that uh, if you're able to do some of the higher up funnel stuff, it actually makes it inclusive from the beginning. So if you are able to actually find diverse personas, you're doing a lot more of the the work up front to make things inclusive. Um, but as far as all the features around the um, Accessibility, uh, as far as the you know, um, yeah. There's it's like a lot. Lo I think there's like a longer tail of engineering work that you can put in here. Um, my philosophy around this so far has been, um, you, you don't want to be reinvesting on things that are um, that you're just going to have to redo over and over again. So on our team, we haven't quite done some of the accessibility engineering yet because we're still moving things around so much. But if you have the opportunity that you know that the investment that you're making is going to be um, worth it and you're not going to have to dig it back up again, go ahead and throw that time in um, and it'll, it'll be worth it. Yeah. And you in the back. So there's a comment earlier about waiting for user testing to find certain things. Yeah. So are there any like, exercises or things you might do to kind of check the internal bio challenges in the initial development phase? So for example, if you're trying to build a product that serves a wide range of technical ability, yeah. but when you, the potential team, your designers, your engineers are all fairly tech savvy, and you know you might be making assumptions that you don't even realize you're doing, like, oh, people are going to know this is a menu, like, 
how to like how to navigate yeah. until you get to user testing like, oh uh, well didn't catch that. So like are yeah. there certain things that you might recommend to in those initial phases to kind of counter attack internal biases? Yeah, so the question is, uh, so if how, how do you counteract the kind of uh, philosophy of all, all your user testing at the end? Because if you catch stuff at the end, it might be a little too late. So how, what can you do to, earlier on in the process to catch biases um, that might be inherent in your design? Um, and I think for that, it's uh, you don't have to wait until the end for user testing. Um, for the products that I've worked on at Google, We've actually done user testing um, even before we started building. So if you have the opportunity now to test something, you're going to get valuable information. Um, another just kind of product manager-y tip trick, um, I think a lot of user, I learned this from user researchers, which is if you can do lower fidelity mocks, it actually produces um, better feedback on the more core concepts. So you don't have to wait for things to be in prototype or even in high fidelity mocks in order for you to start testing. You can do, uh, like Balsamic is one of my favorite tools, uh, where it's just they, they intentionally use a variant of Comic Sans almost uh, for all the UI. But it's because you can start people's feedback. They're like, oh, this is something you're just testing out. So I'll just kind of go a little bit crazier and give you better feedback. So we, we on our project actually um, did wireframe testing before we even started building anything. Um, and I would strongly encourage you to be doing these types of um, uh, check-ins regularly with real users. Um, and then also to back to the kind of B2B question. Um, when I was working on a project called Google Tag Manager, uh, one of the things we did was we started kind of building, um, but then uh, we uh, took, made a PowerPoint presentation and about the product and did a road show um, across the country with a couple of different um, advertising agencies. And they were able to say like, hey, you know what? This really sucks. And you totally missed the mark on what the important feature is here. And so we were able to do that before we started building and uh, actually ended up building in an um, account management system that was much more on point with what the user wanted um, before we built it, which, is, which was great. So it's never too early for user testing. You can't do too much. Um, I, I wish we had bandwidth for more, honestly. Yeah. Two, two more questions. Two more questions. Um, OK, you two. Um, I'll do you first, and then, you, then you. Okay. Uh, OK, uh, actually, in general, how long does it take for user testing? Like, 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 months, days, if I got product? Yeah. Is it also very, I work in D2B as well. And, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, how, how much time do you invest in user testing? Yeah. Um, and I think there's, there's a spectrum here. Um, what I've worked with, the majority of the user testing that I do is bringing people in for half an hour uh, and just getting their eyeballs on it. Um, and uh, no more than two days, probably no more than eight participants. Um, and that'll just kind of give you some, some feedback. Um, you can do these types of roadshow things, and that can take like a week or so. Um, there is a type of user research that happens um, at Google. Uh, if you have a full-time UX researcher, uh, they can go and like do field research. They can like go and do these like crazy expensive surveys and, and you know do you know survey 2,000 people and come up with all these like really awesome insights. That's really intensive, and you may not have time for it. Um, I find these kind of ad hoc, um, you know, eight participants max. Uh, type in, uh, user studies to, to be really helpful. So, yeah. yeah. Um, question comes out of the personal experience, not mine, uh, traveling the day. Mm -hmm. I live in London, I live in Germany. Cool. With my Welcome. Fam my family and my little daughter. Mm -hmm. um, I'm the perfect target user for Lyft with a car seat. Okay. Um, <laughs> there, is, there is a product out there, um, an app, and I, I can't download it because I don't have access to the US app store. Oh, now, yeah, yeah. It's kind of curious. I, I really have no way to get to this product. It's absolutely the product that's been tailored for me. You know, I'm on holiday, I'm spending ah. with it. It's my, it's my baby. And the designers of the product obviously don't know this. Mm. And I can't, and I can't inform them of that. Um, so have you figured that, have you managed to optimize the way you gather, garner, and analyze passive feedback as opposed to user testing work where you can, right. you can get blindsided because you're looking for the people and you can look and you think you're right, but the unknown unknowns, those things that you don't know you're missing, you're never going to look in that particular corner. Yeah. But that message will find you if you have to check you have a channel. Open. Yeah. So the question is, like, how do you, um, so user testing isn't really 
the there's best way to get everything. Bias in user testing. Yeah, there's a bias in user testing. And how do you actually uh, create channels for getting uh, passive user feedback or things that may not involve having an in person thing? And uh, I think to the extent that you can make those channels available um, as much as possible. So um, uh, we're you know working on like different ways in which um, you know you can. Um, there's a product called Instabug. Where you can just like shake stuff, and then uh, user feedback pops up, and that's a way for people to very easily give you feedback. Um, you can also um, like we we look at all of the reviews on the App Store for our app, um, and, and look at that. Um, we have an email address. We you know we, you just try to make as m it possible for people to contact you in as many ways as possible, and try to look at that feedback. Um, if it turns out that there's too much, uh, then you need to try to figure out a way to scale that. But um, for early stage projects um, that usually have a smaller team, uh, you probably won't be overwhelmed um, by how much. Uh, people are contacting you. Um, and just make sure that like, you can, you know, plaster your your email address or whatever as a product um, in as many places as possible, um, and and help people write to you. Um, and also survey people too. So uh, one of the things we also do is, uh, if if people aren't giving us feedback, we'll uh, proactively send out a survey to try to get, solicit user feedback.